So welcome everybody to tonight's talk uh, with Birdability with Freya McGregor. My name is Brett Thielen. I'm the science director for the Harris Center for Conservation Education, um, who is sponsoring tonight's talk. For those of you who might be new to us, the Harris Center is a nonprofit organization based in Southwest New Hampshire, where we help people fall in love with the natural world through land protection, conservation research, and education for all ages. So local folks, we've protected more than 24,000 acres of land from development, and much of that is open for hiking, birding, nature enjoyment, and other recreation. Um, we coordinate conservation research projects on our conserved lands and throughout the region through a variety of really fun community science initiatives. And really at the heart of everything that we do is education from babies and backpacks to residents of retirement communities and all points in between. So we've got our teacher naturalists working with 3000 students every year um, at local schools. And we also have a really incredible calendar of public programs every year, of which this is one. Um, and a really great diversity, everything from um, mushroom walks, which I know some of you might be zooming in right after the mushroom walk tonight, to Zoom lectures, to birding outings, which is how we first came to know birdability. Okay, um, nothing, none of what we do would be possible without donors, and I know there are some of you out there, in, um, so I want to thank you for your support, making it possible to do what we do. And if you're not yet a Harris Center donor, I really encourage you, or supporter, or attendee of events, I encourage you to check us out. We have a lot going on um, and you can find out all about it at harriscenter.org. So with that, without further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce Freya McGregor um, and um, our tonight's speaker. She's the ocu an occupational therapist and also the coordinator for Birdability, which is a new nonprofit focused on making birding and outdoor spaces and the birding community safer, more inclusive and more welcoming for all. And um, I can say that we here at the Harris Center have learned so much from Freya already through the amazing information that she posts on the Birdability website and social media, really opening our eyes and helping us to be more welcoming and inclusive birders ourselves. So um, we're really excited to bring her here virtually and to, um, to share her with our Harris Center audience. So welcome Freya and take it away. Thanks so much, Brett. And thanks everyone. Um, my name is Freya McGregor. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, it's really exciting for me actually to present to you all tonight, um, particularly because um, we, you're, you'll hear about it at the end, but um, this is the first time that I've presented to um, an organization that is a member of the Birdability Founders Circle. Um, so I really appreciate um, the Harris Center's um, support and belief in what we're trying to do at Birdability. Uh, and as a brand new nonprofit, um, donations are particularly important for us now, just as we're getting started. So, uh, Birdability, brand new nonprofit, as, as Brett mentioned, um, I'm the only staff person. Um, I'm the Birdability coordinator. I'm an occupational therapist as well. And if you're not familiar, um, OT is a healthcare profession that um, works to enable people with disabilities, injuries and uh, illnesses to do the things in their everyday life that bring them meaning, but that they're having trouble doing, like birding. Uh, usually it's like tying shoelaces and driving a car and cooking dinner, but um, I, get, I get to help people go birding. It's really exciting. So what do you see in this photo? Uh, I'm going to be describing anything that is on the screen that is otherwise only visual. So if you can't see or you have to turn your screen off or anything like that, uh, if you have low vision, um, you won't miss out on anything. But for those who are sighted, um, what do you see in this photo? I see uh, six different people. Uh, five of them are using manual wheelchairs. Two of those wheelchairs look kind of heavy duty, like not like, like off-road kind of wheelchairs, but they look like they're on, at least it looks like it might be an accessible trail. We'll talk more about that in a minute, but uh, it's concrete, it's flat, it's relatively wide. So they're, they're all good things to start with. Um, I can tell you that is a really accessible trail. I've been there a couple of times. It's in uh, Tucson, Arizona, at Sweetwater Wetlands. Um, all these folks have binoculars. They're all looking in different directions. And there is one standing person 
And so it's really important to point out that not all disabilities and access challenges are visible. Uh, there are a lot of invisible uh, disabilities. And so we don't know if this person has an access challenge or not. And we shouldn't assume just because we can't see a mobility device or other um, obvious um, kind of sign. So what do we know? We know that time spent in nature is good for us. A lot of us inherently know this, you know, if you go for a walk or go sit by the beach or something, people relax, you know, you feel good afterwards, you chill out, but there's a huge amount of um, emerging evidence uh, to support this from the scientific community. Um, we know that time in nature can help reduce blood pressure, reduce um, stress and um, feelings of uh, anxiety, it can help increase our attentional capacity, which is like how much brain space you have to concentrate on things. Uh, time spent in nature is good for us. We also know that birds can be the gateway, uh, the gateway drug to nature. Um, they have beautiful feathers, they make all kinds of weird sounds, they can fly. I mean, that's wild. And a lot of people um, kind of use birds as the excuse, you know, to spend time in nature and get all those health and wellness benefits from that. We know that birding is the fastest growing leisure activity in the US and this data is 20 years old, but in year 2000, there were 85 million Americans who enjoyed wild birds, um, observing, listening or watching wild birds, uh, which is a stack of people and that number we know we increased quite significantly um, since the start of the pandemic with a lot more people noticing birds nearby out their window, you know, birds representing freedom, um, birding, lots of people doing it and it's good for us. Um, we know that birding has the potential to be inclusive and accessible, but we also know that one in four Americans has a disability, including 20 million who have some kind of mobility challenge, difficulty walking or moving, locomoting, mobilizing. Um, and 7 million who are blind or have low vision. So this is a lot of folks. This is not a small portion of the population. We also know this is about our future selves. Uh, as dismal as it is, this is about as pessimistic as I ever get. Um, you never know what's around the corner in your life. And if you don't have a disability or another health concern right now, we can't assume that that will stay that way. Uh, I woke up 18 months ago and couldn't straighten my right knee and that's impacted my mobility quite significantly since uh, it just randomly happened. Um, you know, cancer diagnoses, um, progressive um, long-term health complications, you, you never know what's coming. So, um, and plus, even folks who were as fit and healthy as they might be, but they're just getting older and slowing down. Um, I'd like to be birding when I'm 95 years old. So this isn't actually an us and them conversation. This is just an us conversation. Uh, and as soon as we start realizing that, I think it's a lot easier to really connect to, to the importance of this work. So birdability, um, through education, outreach and advocacy, birdability works to ensure the birding community and the outdoors are welcoming, inclusive, safe and accessible for everybody. We focus on people with mobility challenges, blindness or low vision, chronic illness, intellectual or developmental disabilities, mental illness, and those who are neurodivergent, deaf or hard of hearing, or who have other health concerns. But inherently, there's a whole lot of other folks who might benefit from what we're on about. Parents with strollers, that's a mobility challenge. Uh, grandparents with toddlers, older people, like I said, just slowing down. People with new medical diagnoses, folks with dodgy knees like me. Um, again, this is our future selves. In addition to current birders, we strive to introduce birding to people with disabilities and other health concerns who are not yet birders. So they too can experience the joys of birding. And we certainly have our work cut out. There's a lot of different ways we can um, share birding with different folks and different ways we can kind of find people who may not yet realize that they're actually birders, they just didn't know yet. Um, local disability support groups, spinal cord injuries, amputations, um, multiple sclerosis. I saw someone mention in the chat that, um, that you have MS. Thank you for sharing that. Um, stroke survivors, heaps of different groups. Veterans, my husband's a combat veteran. Uh, he's still in the army. I can vouch for the benefits of birding and nature, unofficial, you know, nature therapy for him um, with his combat related access challenges. Uh, let's see, now I get myself in trouble here. I've got to move my, my own face around the screen a bit. 
bird festivals. That's what it says. If you need to move me out of the way so you can see the slides, you can drag the top black bar and just like move the faces over if you would like it says bird festivals under there um kids disabled camps centers for independent living schools for the deaf schools for the blind rehabilitation hospitals easter seals assisted living centers there's a lot of folks there's a lot of folks folks um and scouting and 4-h groups who could be part of service projects like you know improving the accessibility of existing trails Oh, wow, I was talking fast because I've got a lot to get through and I don't want to miss any of it. So the best we can be is waiting for us in nature. So said Virginia Rose. And if this is true, by the way, shouldn't everybody be able to find their best selves and not have barriers to accessing that, them, their best self? So Virginia is the founder and president of Birdability. She's a retired high school English teacher from Austin, Texas, and has been birding for 17 years. When she was 14 years old, she had a horse riding accident, which resulted in a T10 spinal cord injury, which means that basically from her waist down, she cannot feel um, anything or move anything. And so as a result of that, she uses a manual wheelchair to get around. Um, if you're not familiar, manual wheelchairs are the ones that either you wheel yourself or someone can push you from behind. Power wheelchairs are the ones that like might have a joystick or another kind of device, battery powered um, wheelchairs. Virginia uses a manual wheelchair. So she's not here, but I can introduce you to her with this gorgeous short video that um, was part of a feature on her that National Audubon did three, nearly four years ago. And this is kind of the thing that started all the trouble uh <laughs> this this video in this article i was driving home one day from school and i heard there was going to be a lecture sponsored by travis audubon on the breeding success of the house finch and i thought that sounds interesting and i went and i loved it i had so much fun in the lecture and i came out and i called my mom right away i said mom why didn't you tell me I was a nerd? My life would have been so much easier. Then I started signing up for all the Travis Audubon classes. The field trip leaders never skipped a beat. They just picked me up and took me with them. Literally picked me up. And I've been with them now for about 15 years. Now I'm on the board of directors. Oh, I led beginning bird walks for them for seven years. That's the great crested fly catcher. Brr, brr. Ta -ta. So then I started thinking about how can I take that wonderful experience and give it to other people, other people in wheelchairs, other people who don't know that they can do it. And so I started thinking I need to form an organization called Birdability. And then my job is to find as many physically challenged people and help introduce them to birding, get them situated in Austin all with the accessible places that I have already found and get that pilot program kind of functioning that way and then take it to the national parks so that they know that the, this is a viable population that needs to be rep well represented and birding offers you a way to belong to a group who's outside learning, practicing conservation and contributing. I mean, it's a community just waiting for you. I'm excited about the prospects of not only getting physically challenged people in parks, but getting physically challenged kids in parks. Because I just feel like that can be such an important springboard for them into their lives. The reason why I love using a manual chair is because it's my way of walking. It's, this is walking for me. You know, I've been in a chair 45 years. You have to go for something challenging, something you may not be able to do, and then figure it out. And the amazing thing is that nine times out of 10, you will figure it out. And the feeling that comes from having figured it out is so empowering and so great. Well, I can just tuck that away as a great accomplishment. And I say, of course it's hard, but 
that's where your feeling of accomplishment comes from. And that's Virginia. So when she started birding as a manual wheelchair user, she discovered a bunch of difficulties that other standing people around with her birding with her didn't have. Parking was a challenge. We're going to talk about a few of these in a bit more detail shortly. Uh, gates, not necessarily easy to get past, around or under. Uh, bathrooms, steps and curbs. One step is the difference between a location being truly accessible or not for a lot of folks. Railing height, we'll talk a bit more about that. Uh, not easy to see birds when there's a chunk of wood right in your way. Mud and sand, really difficult to travel over in a wheelchair. And she's in Texas. Uh, I appreciate these might not be terribly relevant in New Hampshire. Um, I used to live in Boston for a couple of years. So um, anyway, cattle guards, cactus vines, and cow patties. Um, she'll tell you that cow patties on your boots are one thing, but cow patties on your wheels and then on your hands is a whole different story. Um, and all of these things individually and cumulatively led to a lack of independence for her. And she will tell you that for her, being unattended in nature is where the real joy is. She does not want to have to need someone else's help. But difficulty and uncertainty lead to empowerment and joy. And this is one of my favorite photos of Virginia. That's her sister, Kathy. Um, they were birding in the big thicket in East Texas. Uh, they'd just been looking for a Swainson's warbler and they found one. Um, so very excited there, but I want you to notice Virginia drives a van. She drives. Yes. You can drive without use of your legs. Uh, there's different hand controls you can use to modify vehicles. Uh, but that if you've ever seen accessible parking spaces, you might've noticed some of them have, they'll say van accessible parking and a van accessible parking space has an extra aisle. It's called the, that bit that's got those diagonal lines going across it. It, it's there so that someone who has a ramp, like Virginia's van does, um, the ramp deploying out the side, the ramp needs to be able to get out, but the person also needs to have the space to get on and off the ramp. If Virginia can't use her ramp, she can't get out of her van, so she can't access that location at all. And if you take nothing else from this presentation tonight, please, please never park in those diagonal lines. That's really important for a lot of people to be able to access wherever they're trying to go with that parking space and you'll completely ruin their day. And if you park someone in, I mean, please don't do that. That's not, that is not a parking space. Anyhow, lots of joys in birding for Virginia. Learning, friendships, travel, whether that's interstate, internationally, or just down the road to a place you haven't been before. Physical health benefits, confidence, independence, the sense of community. She mentioned that in that video. Uh, purpose and the birds. Um, so many wonderful things we can get out of birding uh, and so many other people can get those things out of birding too. So that is what we are all about. No one can predict what an individual with an accessibility challenge can or cannot do, says Virginia. Uh, as an occupational therapist, I'll back that up. Um, sometimes that person doesn't even know until they've tried and maybe tried a few times, a few different ways or just practiced. Um, and it's important that we keep that in mind and don't say no for the person um, who we might be trying to help um, or for ourselves for that matter. Um, so access considerations. There's a bunch of things that make um, a birding location, a trail, uh, a bird blind, an observation platform, a feeder station, um, accessible or not. These are only a few. There is a lot more on our website. Um, I Unfortunately, if we spoke for three hours, I might be able to cover all the things that I want to tell you about. I did do a big webinar during Birdability Week a couple of weeks ago. It was a whole hour just on access consideration. So if you're really interested in listening to me talk some more, um, you can find that on our YouTube channel. Um, or you can check out this, this webpage, Access Considerations webpage. But um, parking is one. We mentioned um, parking and van accessible parking, really important. Finding out the trail information ahead of time. Most websites will just tell you, we have an accessible trail. What does that mean? <laughs> um, there's so many bits that make up an accessible trail and that is not enough detail for most people. Um, that's why we have the birdability map. And I'll talk about that in a second too. 
but also at trailheads, um, signs that have detailed information about the access features of that trail, the surface, the tread width, the gradient, the steepness, and the cross slope, which is how much of an angle you're on as you're traveling down that trail, particularly important for folks using mobility devices who don't want to tip over. Bathroom accessibility. There's a bunch of things that goes into their stall size, sink height, so you can actually reach it from a wheelchair. Um, there's heaps of things, but uh, let's talk about port just for a second. Um, these two port most of these photos I took at my favorite accessible trail, which is at Mammoth Cave National Park in Kentucky. It's really fantastic. And if you're ever involved in renting port you can get standard size ones and you can get accessible ones. And if you get accessible ones, everyone can use it. And I don't need an accessible port -a -loo. I, I I'm a walking person, but I'd rather use one. There's more space. It never gets as hot and stuffy inside and it doesn't kind of feel as confined and maybe stinky <laughs> as the regular size port -a So um, this is something to think about with, with the, this applies for a lot of things. If you can just design something from the start to be accessible for the greatest number of people, there are so many more people who can benefit from that. And you're not excluding someone just by design. Interpretive signs. There's a few things that go into good interpretive signs too. Um, the font that's a good size to make it readable. Uh, contrast, good contrast between the color of the text and the background not having the background too distracting. Um, tactile features, this, this sign has a tactile feature, that top right hand piece of the sign you can feel. Uh, it's, it's pretending to be the bark of a sycamore tree. Really cool. Um, you might think that someone who's blind or has low vision are the only people who would benefit from that, but like many things with access uh, and inclusion, often there are many other people who will benefit from that as well as the the group of people that you think initially will be the only beneficiaries. People, kids who are dyslexic, adults who are dyslexic, um, people who like learning by feeling, kinesthetic learners, um, little toddlers who just want to touch stuff but aren't going to read a sign. Um, older folks, maybe people with dementia, um, people who, in this instance, the signs are only available in English. Well, what if you can't read English? But you can still learn something, you can still engage because there's a tactile feature. Um, the other thing that is really awesome with tactile science, uh, with interpretive science, is having some kind of ability to learn that information from audio, um, particularly for people who are blind who have low vision, but a lot of other folks as well. Uh, you can have a QR code, scan it with your phone, listen to the reading of the sign. If you have a smartphone and if there's reception, which there isn't at all at Mammoth Cave National Park. Um, some visitor centers will have loner like um, wand, you know, not tape players anymore, but um, different, you know, devices. You can go around and listen to signs um, talking to you. Uh, if the visitor center is open, which many were not, at least at the start of the pandemic. And um, the visitor center from this trail is like five miles away. So less helpful. This, this just next to the sign, there's a pillar and it has a solar panel. And you just press a button, it's always open and it doesn't matter if your battery is dead on your phone. Really, really cool. And because of that, I learned how to say uh, on the sign, you might be able to see there's some photos of different flowers and they had the common name and the scientific name. And I learned how to say some Latin stuff because of the audio sign. So that's really neat. Two more things about interpretive signs. The height is really important if you want people who are seated or kids to be able to read it and Signs, benches and tables need to be connected to the trail by a paved surface so people can get from the trail to that feature. This one is, it's in a pullout, even better. You can move off the, you're not in the line of traffic, but you're still on the paved surface in the pullout and uh, kind of, you know, get out of people's way, but still not have to get off the trail surface, which might be a problem depending on your access needs. Maintenance, really important. No matter how wonderful and accessible your trail is, it won't be in a year or two if you don't maintain it. Uh, roots, you know, coming up through the concrete or the asphalt. Um, vegetation, branches hanging really low down, um, creating a hazard for folks who can't see. You know, no one wants to walk into a tree trunk. Um, shrubs and bushes growing in on the side of the trail, encroaching on that lovely wide trail that now someone can't get through. Uh, snow. Uh, 
okay places aren't going to be able to plow every single time it snows I totally get that but what you can do is share on your website the plowing schedule and if it snows on Friday night but your website says you only plow Mondays Wednesdays and Fridays someone who has a, is a wheelchair user for example or who has some other kind of mobility challenge will know that it may not really be worth driving two hours to visit this site on Saturday because it won't be plowed and they won't be able to get through the snow and leaves also really important um a thick cup of the leaves is really fun to crunch through if you don't have a mobility challenge uh sweeping them off the trail is really good uh railing height i mentioned earlier uh many different ways to construct safety barriers and railings and most of them involve for some reason must be the cheapest way to do it uh, a thick plank of wood at the top um, which creates a massive visual barrier um, especially important if you're trying to find birds and you are seated there's lots of different ways to create more accessible barriers that create less of a visual obstruction. The best way is to remove the visual barrier entirely. And this place, this at Mammoth Cave, uh, two sections of the barrier have been replaced with um, perspex, no, plexiglass, no, perspex. I don't remember what the American word is. It's one of those. Um, I'm from Australia, if you were wondering about my accent. Uh, and so everyone can see through it. So Virginia in her wheelchair could see straight through that. A little toddler can see straight through it and not be like looking through the like jail bars. Um, I can rest my dodgy knee on a bench and still see through. So whenever you can remove the barrier entirely, that is great. Although we definitely don't want to remove safety barriers if you need to keep it safe. We can make them, we can build them better though. Steps or other obstacles, like I mentioned before, one step is a no-go. Um, but if you have it, this is the other thing. If you have it, don't, not everyone needs for there to be no step. So tell people what you have, what is or isn't there. We're going to get to that in when I tell you about the vetability map. But steps, roots, um, bollards, the little short pillar things, giant rocks trying to stop cars going down a trail. These can also sometimes stop mobility devices getting down a trail as well. And bird blinds. Uh, there's a few things that go into a, a well well designed accessible bird blind. Um, this one, unfortunately, mulch is not a great surface um, from an accessibility standpoint, but it does have a really low window. Um, super awesome for a wheelchair user or a shorter person or someone who wants to bring a chair. You know, a lot of people benefit from access consideration, well, well thought out access considerations. So I told you that most websites don't have enough information about their uh, accessible trail. And so our solution to that, while we advocate for this to improve, is the birdability map. This is a partnership we have with National Audubon and anyone can contribute to that. And this is one thing that we would love for you to do to help, um, help us with our work. Uh, it's, a, um, it's a brief, well, it's not that brief. It's not that hard though. I promise it's not that hard. It's 19 questions. Is that brief? Uh, survey, and you just tell us what is or isn't there, especially if you're a bird or a naturalist, you know how to be observant. So this shouldn't be that difficult. Um, take a tape measure. Um, the more information you can provide here, the more help it will be to someone with um, a disability or a health concern uh, who needs to find out if there are gates or bollards and, and what the situation is with them. There's always a space to write comments um, for all these questions. Really, really helpful. And at the end, um, Anyone can click on one of those yellow diamonds and uh, find out that information ahead of time. You can also link directly to a site review. So if you're going on a bird outing, if you're leaving a bird outing you can, and is, you, you want to include people with access challenges, you can say, you can include this information in your write-up. Uh, that would be great. Or you can just link directly if it's an online listing to um, your site review um, for all that information. Um, as you can see, uh, we believe especially as an Australian, that our work uh, applies wherever there are people and birds, which is basically everywhere. Uh, and so if you're traveling anywhere, um, from the introductions in the chat, it looked like we're all coming from the US, but if you're traveling anywhere, we'd love you to add reasonably accessible birding locations to the birdability map. Reasonably accessible, because like I said, not everyone needs the same stuff. Virginia has different access needs as a wheelchair user than I do, 
although I have a mobility challenge, I can still walk. Um, and folks who are blind or have low vision have different needs and folks who are autistic have different needs. And so um, if it's reasonably accessible, that's basically the only judgment call we ask you to make um, in that process. We would love to have it on, on the bird ability map so more people can find out about it. And by the way, you're all super trained up how to do this now because you've just come to this presentation and you know a little bit more about the sorts of things that make an accessible trail or other birding location. So a slight change of gear. Uh, I believe that birding is the act of enjoying wild birds. And language is important. Um, I need to, I don't know, um, Susie or um, Brett, you might be able to Google really quickly redefining birding and you'll find an article that I wrote for Audubon um, earlier this year about this concept. Um, if we define birding this broadly, we can be so much more welcoming and inclusive, not just to folks who are blind or have low vision, who are not probably bird watchers, um, but bird by ear, as well as beginner birders who can get really hung up on like if they're somehow qualified enough to call themselves a bird or if they've been birding long enough or if, like who who dishes out that qualification no no nobody um you don't need binoculars to be a birder not everyone can afford them not everyone likes using them um you don't need to be checking birds off a list you can be enjoying them quietly and peacefully um you you don't even need to know what they're called <laughs> What's their name? Uh, birding, the act of enjoying wild birds. Um, let me know in the chat if, if um, what you think about this idea. Uh, I'm definitely interested to hear your thoughts on this, on this rede redefining of birding. Um, so yeah, birdwatcher, by the way, you always, always can identify however you like. Um, this is just my broad broad recommendation um, people are allowed to identify however they want to and so if this doesn't sing to you that's totally okay but as the as part of the birding community I think these little quick word swaps um, can help us be more more welcoming and inclusive to others in a general way even if they don't apply directly to you so even though I grew up in Australia where everyone a bird including my parents still are bird watchers um, I talk about being a birder now because I don't want to emphasize the eyes um, and I don't talk about bird walks anymore I talk about bird outings or field trips not everyone can walk and um, plenty of folks including Virginia who don't walk will call them bird walks but um, the walking people it's really not that hard as an Australian living in the US I can tell you it's not that hard to make a really simple word swap especially if it means means that more people will feel welcome to attend the event that you're holding so uh bird outing um but these are these are two things that that are kind of important too uh, again everyone is welcome to always to identify however they like but generally language changes and evolves um and generally handicapped and impaired are seen as out of date and sometimes offensive um, and it's really quite okay to say someone has a disability or is disabled because there is nothing wrong with that. So we don't need to dance around those words like there is something wrong with that. There isn't. So you can just say it. Um, likewise, normal. Not a good word in general in this conversation. Um, probably what you mean is they're able-bodied or they're non-disabled or they're sighted or they're hearing or they're neurotypical. Um, steer away from normal in, in this kind of conversation. Wheelchair bound, we also definitely want to avoid. Wheelchairs do not bind people. People are not bound to or by their wheelchair. Wheelchairs are freedom machines. They're just a wheelchair user. They use a wheelchair to get around. That's all there is. Um, and because we're moving away from impaired, um, many people still use this, um, but generally, um, we're getting away from vision impaired and you can say that someone is blind or has low vision. I know that low vision seems kind of vague um, in general English usage, but it's actually a technical uh, like diagnostic term. Um, my background is in blindness and low vision services. Um, and it's basically the point at which your eye condition, um, many different kinds of eye conditions, many age related um, glasses no longer help. So um, 
there's all different kinds of, we, we don't have time to go into that, but um, you might know someone with macular degeneration or cataracts or retinitis pigmentosa. They're all different um, eye conditions that can cause low vision. All right, so it's not enough to just think you're being inclusive. You have to be intentionally inclusive. This often takes more effort. It may take more time and sometimes it takes more money, but this is the difference between just assuming people know they're welcome and going out of your way to make sure that they definitely know you want them to be here. So when you write up, if you're ever um, preparing a bird outing event description or any other nature hikes or, or programs, um, there's a whole lot of stuff we'd love you to include. Um, of course, you need the date, date, the date, the day, date, time and meeting place, but state that this is an accessible, inclusive bird outing and tell us if the beginners are welcome or small children. Um, we want detailed information about the physical accessibility of the location. You can link directly to the birdability map, um, but we want a few key details in the, in the description like gradient, uh, distance traveled, shade, um, Will loaner equipment be available? Um, what kind and how many? If you're inviting 60 people, but you only have two pairs of loaner binoculars and my husband and I want to come and don't have, we do have binoculars, but if we didn't and you only have two pairs available, you know, that's important to know because um, if we had kids and wanted to bring them and they all needed binoculars, well, and what kind? Do you have any adaptive birding equipment? There's a whole page on our website for, with different ideas for different kinds of adaptive birding equipment. Really cool, especially um, if you're holding accessible outings. And provide the contact information for leaders, um, and especially if they have their own access challenge. Um, that can be really reassuring to someone who's new and not sure if they'll be a burden to the group. Uh, but then they find out that the, the leader themselves uses a walking frame or, or a wheelchair. Like that's really comforting. Um, it also invite people to share any access needs they have and to get in touch with the leader ahead of time if they have any access needs that they, that they want the leader to know about. Um, it, that feels really welcoming to know that people are considering your needs ahead of time and want to make sure that you can attend and participate to the best of your ability. Welcoming and inclusive bird outing leaders. Uh, this goes for birders too, but written from the perspective of someone leading and outing. There's a bunch of stuff you can do. Here are a couple of ideas to make sure people know that they are welcome and you want to include them. Say hello and smile. The say hello bit is important because um, people who are blind or have low vision might not see you smile at them. Um, include a welcome statement at the beginning of the outings and share your pronouns and behavioral expectations. It might be as simple as, hello, everyone. My name's Freya McGregor. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm really excited to go birding with you today. Uh, we're birding here today on Muscogee Creek land. And uh, not everyone um, is an expert on birds. I'm not an expert. No one knows everything uh, about birds. And so if you have any questions at all, please ask. Uh, there's no such thing as a stupid question. And anyone nearby, if you can't reach me, anyone nearby will be happy to help you out if they, if they have any answers, which is a bit of a hint to folks. Hey, y'all, you're expected to be friendly and help other people. Don't single someone out because of a difference unless it is relevant. And if you have to do that, do it one-on-one. -on -one. That might be something like, hey, I, I see you're using crutches today and I just wanted to let you know that up ahead there's like three steps in about half a mile. Um, I'm happy to help you with them. Um, you let me know what, what you need or, or we can figure out another thing um, when we get there. Um, and doing it, you know, at the back of the group kind of quietly, like it's, it's not some dirty big secret, but there's no reason to kind of broadcast that to the entire group. Um, offer help, but be prepared to graciously accept no. A lot of kind hearted people want to help folks with disabilities, but just striding in and suddenly pushing someone's wheelchair is terrifying and not helpful uh, and very disempowering as well. So you have to ask, hey, do you need a hand with that? Um, if they say no, don't get all hoiked up about it. Like, be cool. 
just say, oh, no worries. Let me know if you do. I'm happy to help later on. Um, if they do want help, the next question is, how would you like me to help? Because they're the expert on them um, and they will be able to guide you the best way that they need help. So take their lead. Believe someone if they identify a bird. Trust but verify. It is really discouraging uh, when you are birding with a new group and you say, hey, look, guys, there's an American red stud over there. And someone says, oh, really? I, I experienced this as an Australian. I guess my accent um, demonstrates that I don't know anything about North American birds. Um, or maybe it's because I'm younger and female. I don't know, but it's, it's really discouraging. And I don't really want to go birding with that person or that group again. So, and this happens a lot to folks with vis visible disabilities there. And, and I know a lot of folks who are BIPOC too. Um, it's assumed that they don't know. That's obnoxious. Uh, don't do that. Really easy attitude adjustment. Trust but verify, which looks like, oh, what an American red start. That's so cool. Let's see. And then go look. And if it's not, like kindly, gently explain what the difference is between the bird that it is and what the bird that they thought it was. Don't just assume someone doesn't know what they're talking about when they call out an ID. And be actively anti-racist. There is a difference between being not racist and being anti-racist. Um, that is a lot of homework for folks who are white or white passing. If you haven't read up on this stuff, if you haven't um, dived deep into anti-racism practice, please do that. Um, there is a lot in there and it's really important. Um, the other thing to make sure, I need, I need to have a whole slide on this actually, intersectionality is the concept that there are many people have share multiple identities. Uh, if our work was only um, helping folks with disabilities who were white and straight and cisgendered, we would not be inclusive. There are a lot of black wheelchair users and folks who are gay and have chronic fatigue. So it's really important to be anti-racist, to um, be really aware of transphobia and homophobia while you're also working on being inclusive of folks with disabilities as well. All right, don't force someone to opt out. Go out of your way to allow them to opt in if they want to. <laughs> I should have that in brackets at the bottom of this slide. So what does that look like for organisations? I know the Harris Centre is doing a lot of really good work in this. I'm really, really excited um, to, see, to see what the Harris Centre has done and will continue to do in this department. This might even not even be a gigantic organization. This might just be a local, you know, impromptu group of friends that you're gathering together to go birding with. But here's some ideas to help um, in, to invite people to opt in to participation. Include an inclusion and diversity statement on your website and use it to hold your employees, volunteers, and organization accountable for the actions you will take to be inclu inclusive and um, encourage diversity. Hold accessible bird outings as part of your regular programming um, and include that detailed in accessibility information in the write-up. By the way, in October, to help celebrate Birdability Week, we invited um, anybody, uh, Audubon chapters, bird clubs, nature centres, anywhere, um, to hold accessible outings throughout October. And the Harris Centre held two, which was really cool. So thank you for doing that. Please keep doing it. Don't just do it in October, keep doing it and reach out to your local disability community. All those groups, there's a, there's a page on our website, Steps to Implement, um, that whole list is there. Reach out to those folks and invite them to come birding. Um, really, really awesome. Include image descriptions for social media posts. Uh, many folks who are blind or have low vision and people with dyslexia and, and um, visual processing disabilities use screen reader software, which reads aloud the text on a screen, but it can't read a photo. There's nothing to read about a photo. Um, an image description just describes what is going on in that photo or that graphic, because otherwise you are forcing that person to opt out of learning that information. And I've heard people say, oh, well, blind people don't use Instagram. Why would they? It's all photos. Well, you just forced a whole bunch of people to opt out. And I can tell you, 
that is inaccurate. So even if it's your personal social media account, you don't think you have any friends who benefit from it, it's actually really fun to read image descriptions because sometimes as a sighted person, I miss stuff that the original poster wanted me to pick up on. So image descriptions help everybody. So they're for social media posts. And then on, uh, on websites, uh, it's called alt text, alternative text. It's like embedded with the photo. So you don't see it, but the screen reader software will read it when it comes to the photo or the infographic. Includes closed caption, include closed captions for all webinars and meetings, even if no one has asked for them. That's that thing about inviting people to opt in. Thank you for having closed captions, Harris Center. Um, YouTube videos, um, Instagram reels, there's all kinds of places where closed, automatically generated closed captions are available and they're pretty good. So please, please use them, just have them there. And remove financial barriers to access whenever possible. It's not always possible, but sometimes you can have a couple of scholarships. You can get some um, funding from sponsors. Um, you can have a pay what you will, pay, pay what you wish model. Um, and a lot of folks and folks with disabilities, I mean, disability is expensive, um, will not be able to participate if the cost of entry is too much. So Anytime you can remove the financial barrier to access is a good thing. And provide honorariums to speakers and consultants. Um, it isn't fair to expect someone, especially someone from a historically marginalized um, group um, to teach you or entertain you for free. Um, a famous birder or naturalist um, is going to have a speaker's fee. They will. It's their job. They're going to have a speaker's fee and you pay them for it. So if you're asking someone to present, um, you should provide an honorarium. Um, this goes to if you're, um, if you have just built the most amazing accessible trail and you want a bunch of folks with disabilities to come out and check it out and give you feedback, that's their time and energy and lived experience um, that you are asking from them. So even if it's as little as like 50 bucks just to cover gas, um, please provide an honorarium um, because it shows that you value their contributions and their, um, and their time and their expertise. All right, I'm nearly there. I'm nearly there. We've got like three more slides, I think. So we have a few different resources for verters with access challenges. Um, everything on our website is up there. It's free. We want you to share it with anyone you think would benefit. That's why we create them. Um, so we have the birdability map. We have a web page on adaptive birding equipment. We have um, a Facebook group. You're welcome to join and share resources and chat with other folks. Um, I really enjoy using the birdability blog to amplify the experiences of birders with access challenges. Um, it's an amazing way to learn about other people's lives and what you can do to be more welcoming and inclusive. Um, we have a lot of virtual programming. Actually, this Saturday, um, I'll be helping host a virtual field trip with George Audubon. Um, we'll have two, well, including me, <laughs> three birders with access challenges and a fourth, Karina Newsom from George Audubon, um, birding in four different states at the same time on accessible trails, which is really a lot of fun. Um, come along to that on Saturday. You can find the link under the events calendar on our website to register. It's free. There are closed captions. Um, also, another virtual program coming up soon is um, I'm doing an uh, interview series with the American Bird Conservancy, having one and a half hour, <laughs> well, one hour deep conversations and then like half an hour of questions from the audience with one birder with an access challenge about their life with their access challenge and what they need from the birding community. Um, it's been, it's, we're up to number three coming up here soon. Leticia Suarez has long COVID and fibromyalgia, which is a chronic health condition that causes a lot of pain and brain fog and stuff. So uh, really, really interesting. And everything's recorded, but you can't ask them questions if you watch the recording on YouTube. So anyway, sign up to our newsletter, monthly newsletter, um, or follow us on social media to find out about all these virtual programs because um, there's plenty of them um, coming your way. And we have a lot more on our website, um, links and loads of guidance documents. We really want to encourage this year Christmas bird counts. We're working with National Audubon, 
the Christmas bird count folks there um, to try and make sure there are uh, more, at least partly accessible Christmas bird counts. And if you're involved in the CBC, please check out that. That's new. That's just up this week. So um, lots, lots on our website. And lastly, I mentioned this right at the start, um, as a brand new nonprofit, <laughs> donations are really, really, really important. And um, it's so awesome that the Harris Centre has joined our founder circle. Um, if you um, yourself or your family or an organisation or company that you're attached to in some way would like to support our work um, to help make sure that, the, that birding in the outdoors truly is for every body, um, please, uh, if you're able to consider joining our Founders Circle, there's more information about that on uh, our website. And any donation, big or small, is greatly appreciated. And I will make sure, if it isn't already, I'll make sure there's a donation link in the chat. Um, if you've learned anything tonight, if you um, think this is a good idea, um, really appreciate your donations. Because birding is for everybody and everybody. Uh, my email address is info birdability.org it's only me behind the scenes here so if it takes me a few days to get back to you i do apologize but uh, there's a lot going on um, and instagram facebook and twitter and youtube uh, at birdability all right i think i nearly made it um, let's go for questions <laughs> thank you so much freya that was just such an incredible wealth of information i've use a lot of those resources already and I can't recommend them highly enough for everyone who's interested in this. There's so much great knowledge you're sharing freely available. So thank you. Um, I also want to thank uh, the anonymous donor who made it possible for the Harris Center to become part of the Founder Circle. We are so excited to be able to support your work. It's, it's really meaningful for us. So thanks to everyone. Um, and now there are definitely a few questions and I'm gonna take the liberty of starting with my own, but we'll get to other people's too. But we, we've had um, some interns and staff members that have been out kind of looking at trails, our trails, the, um, as well as other local trails for in potential inclusion on the birdability map. We're really hoping to be able to kind of fill out New Hampshire on that map. But one of our big takeaways has been that our trails are not as accessible as we thought that they were. So we have a, a number of rail trails that we maintain that we thought were accessible because they're kind of flat and wide. Um, but as we looked through all the, the points on the birdability map checklist, we realized there's a lot of other elements that we hadn't considered. And so, you know, when you said reasonably accessible, I'm wondering if there's anything that you consider bare minimum. Is there like a kind of trail surface or slope or parking? Like, are all trails with routes just automatically ruled out? Um, no, no. So there's, there is, so on the website under contribute to the vertibility map, um, there is a couple of like really baseline criteria for what we consider to be the bare minimum for a, a reasonably accessible trail, um, preferably concrete, uh, at least asphalt or boardwalk um, surface as flat, as flat, as flat as it can be. Um, yeah. All trails with routes. I mean, I can walk over routes, so that's not, that doesn't, that rules out some people, but not everybody. That's why there isn't like a hard and fast rule about any of this, but this whole like reasonably accessible concept. And as you work through the site review, um, there's a really great printable checklist for it too. You can download and take out with you. Um, you'll, you'll get a pretty good understanding pretty quickly of what, um, what we're going for. And if a site just is really not checking the right boxes, like you'll, you'll know that pretty quickly. So, um, but yeah, flat, concrete, no or minimal steps um that's kind of that's a a bit of a litmus test um for that great thank you um so there's another question and i also would remind people if you have questions please pop them in the chat um a couple of questions kind of about driving um so one of which was how do you, or are you thinking about helping non-drivers with transportation to birding sites? Is that something that you have considered? Okay, so birdability is, is a staff of, of one in one place. Uh, <laughs> and so a lot of our work is about empowering local organizations and individuals. We have a whole stack of volunteers all over the country and a few internationally um, to do this work in their own communities because me in Alabama and Virginia and Texas can only do so much where we are. So um, we can't 
transport people. I mean, <laughs> that, you, are not, there recommendations for organizations like us? Like, sh is that something we should strive to offer so a place like the Harris Center or? Sure. So we don't have any recommendations on that at the, at this point in time, but, um, but local organizations, you'll know what matters to you because I mean, some nature centers are like in a city, like th there's public transport everywhere. That's not really a big issue for, for most folks there, but there's, there'll be places, you know, that more rural that are much harder to get to. So um, we don't have any recommendations on that, but it definitely is an access consideration. And it is one of the questions right at the start of the site review, asking about public transport access and biking access. You know, if there's trails like bike trails and walking trails, people can get to the location using can you give some examples of what we need to consider in order to provide access for those with hidden disabilities? Because we were thinking um, a lot about mobility. All of the above. Um, so, I mean, I have a hidden access challenge with my knee. You can't see that I have something going on with my knee. I can only tell you when my knee is causing me a problem and I need to sit down. Um, closed captions, hearing, often not visible disability. Um, most eye conditions that cause low vision, you can't tell um, that someone has has low vision um there's all these chronic fatigue um chronic illness um health conditions benches uh, yeah so the access considerations guidance documents yes i went on a bit about mobility because that's really specific to trails um and there's so many different kinds of mobility challenges but if you go and look at a, our um, guidance document on access considerations there's a lot in there about all different kinds of different kinds of hidden um disabilities well, I want to, um, we're reaching 6.30, so I think it, um, it makes sense for us to wrap up, but I, I just can't thank you enough for sharing all of this with us and for bringing this to the Harris Center community. We've, it's a work in progress for us at the Harris Center building, for sure, and on our trails and in our programs, but we are really um, learning every day and really working to, to, to put into practice what, what we're learning from you, and we hope that um, other folks feel inspired, too, to kind of move forward, and we are thinking about um, a volunteer training for the spring where we can kind of walk people through that vertibility map checklist and kind of um, really look at some of those things in more detail. So um, if you're interested in that, uh, Harris Center folks, local folks, stay tuned. Um, there will be more to come from us on that, I think. So with that, thank you so much and um, see you all for, for more birding to come. So, Thanks so much, everyone.